Vanakam, this is um, a truly humbling experience to be in front of so many um, uh, Shaiva Bhaktas. Uh, it's rather scary. Um, I am also in front of these two swamis, whom I think I have seen at Chidambaram on various occasions. I first went to Chidambaram in 1986. The first day I walked into the sanctum was the 25th of December 1986, and it was after the Arudra Dashanam. I came back too late, two years later to, uh, to uh, experience the Arudra festival, and since then I have missed only one. So I'm just um, praying that I can keep it together for talking to you today briefly. So um, as um, mentioned, I grew up in a Christian tradition, and uh, as most um, people did from my era uh, in Australia, now Australia is thankfully a wonderful multicultural place. And I was um, brought into this tradition with a, a view on art which was primarily one of looking at artistic sort of surface, all of these things, and not really understanding what the meanings were. Fortunately for us, um, this has changed, this emphasis has changed, um, and a large part of it is due to the fact that we have had so many other cultures like the Hindu tradition, Islam, and also our, our growing understanding of our own Aboriginal tradition, and the fact that it has all sorts of uh, meanings and um, intangible uh, aspects to its uh, practices and rituals and culture and we rather sort of superficial um, white Anglo-Saxon um, Christians have had to uh, grapple with this and understand it. So when I first, I grew up with this attitude of, you know, Ganesha, you see him in a museum and he looks like a nice piece of art and everything that's written about him in the catalogue is also telling you that he's not much more than a piece of art. But really, he is an Utsava Moti. He is, uh, in this bronze aspect, he's an Utsava Moti and his real meaning is in what he represents, what aspect of the Absolute he is showing to us and trying to teach us. My journey has been one to try and understand this little fellow. Is that clear? Can we make that slightly focused better? That's better. Um, this fellow here, whom I first saw in an exhibition in London in 1982, and then I was mesmerized by him. Um, I had no idea why. But when I went to Chiramaram, I understood so what I want to do is talk to you about um, briefly about the Arudra festival. This is a slide I showed the other day, and it shows the Vastu Purusha Mandala with the, um, the image of Vastu face down on the ground, pinned by the eight directions and all of the presiding deities to hold him in place, creating order out of chaos. The temple plan is based on the same idea and has a series of concentric walls defining prakarams, and that uh, uh, in the Shiva temple, there are five prakarams, but the outer one is actually beyond the temple wall. So it's the whole of this world. During the festival, the whole of that prakaram, that, the whole of that Vastu Purusha Mandala is energized to its fullest extent and is extended out to include that fifth prakaram, the car streets. This is a plan of the temple as it, as it is within those walls. And you can see there the gates are not opposite each other. But if I could just explain a few things. Um, the sanctum is here. This is the east gopuram here. This is the south gopuram. When uh, the deities come out, they come out from the uh, sabha here. This is during the eight days preceding the ninth day when Nataraja himself comes out. The deities come from here. They come out this gate, they go along this passage and across here and then out this gateway and then they go around the four car streets. When Nataraja comes out, he takes a slightly different journey. He comes 
out of the sanctum to the Kanaka Sabha. He then goes east, then he goes around his own sanctum, then he comes through this gateway, then he goes around the next prakaram here, and then he comes out through this gateway, and then he proceeds out here, goes out, comes out, and goes out to the car streets and then comes around. When he comes back in, he comes back in the same way through that gateway, comes through this doorway here, which is the main Gopuram is there, comes through this doorway and is then taken up to the steps of the Raja Sabha. Um, the Mahabhishekam is performed in this on this platform here, and then after that Rajas, after that Mahabhishekam, he is then taken back up to this point at the very end of the Raja Sabha and is then um, given alankaram and prepared for the Arudra Dashanam itself. When you look at a Google picture of the temple, the Raja Sabha is right in Ishanya corner. All of those corners line up. This is the crowning place. This is what um, Dr. Sabratnam was saying the other day, that the uh, Mahabhishekam is really a crowning ceremony. It's an empowering ceremony. And what he said last Sunday um, rang very, very clearly with me because that's what I have seen. Uh, these are just photographs in the temple taken during the festival. So there is one procession with the Panchamorti preparing to come out around the Prakaram. People are chanting Vedas. Um, they're also chanting Devaram. Uh, this is a, a, a Veda Parayanam organized by um, a number of different dictionaries, but the main one who organizes the, the large um, Veda Parayanam is um, Sri Parameshwara Dikshita. Uh, whom I um, count as a very close friend. And then during each festival, during each part of the procession, or during the, the nine days, um, there are daily processions around the temple. And every morning, every lunchtime, and every evening. So it's, it's um, just after sunrise, uh, at around noon, and also then in the evening, uh, closer to midnight, there are processions which go around and the um, uh, Dikshita organizes for the fellows who are chanting um, the Vedas and all the Tevaram, etc., uh, follow along behind this procession as it goes around. That's a ritual. Preceding the, um, preceding the Panchamurti are musicians, and then on the fifth day we have the Raja Gopuram when uh, Natra, not Nataraja, um, Shiva has come out uh, on a vrishaba, a, a big silver bull, and is put in the centre of this gopuram and then taken about round. It's a bit like a bulldozer. It clears out any limbs off trees, um, traffic lights being put in the wrong places. It clears them out in preparation for the main procession. And I've seen it actually demolish things like that. Um, it's a good sort of trial run. Going back to the sanctum itself, when Nataraja comes out, this temple is extremely unusual. The Mula Murti in most temples is a stone image. It's fixed, it doesn't move. It has a representative, which is the Yotsuba Murti, which is in bronze, which is then taken out on behalf of the Mula Murti. So it, it, the power, the whole presence of that deity is transferred to that Yotsuba Murti and then taken out. In Chiramaram, the Mula Murti is the Yotsuba Murti. That is why no photographs are allowed in that temple. And I, I have no photographs of Nataraj. I have no photographs of the deity there. That's why I'm showing you images of other mortis that are photographable. But here, Nataraja himself comes out, so it's even more powerful. And when he comes out, he comes out the east doorway and he goes around the sanctum. And they cover the areas around that prakaram. And when I first saw this particular procession, which is on the ninth morning, um, I went to the temple early with my friends and um, there was uh, Nadeswaram, drums, everything. Uh, extremely loud sound, all the bells are ringing. It's almost deafening for most people and there are thousands of people there. And I, just before, we were waiting for the doors to open. And as we waited, um, there was the, you could feel the energy was building up and up and up, waiting for the doors for open for him to come out. 
and I looked up in the sky and I saw a, um, a structure in the sky which was um, not a solid structure. It was like a glass pyramid in the sky. You could see through it. The birds were flying through it and the first rays of the sun were catching these birds. And this structure was like a stepped pyramid. And on each corner, Sorry, just remembering it is quite an experience. But on each corner and in the middle of each side at every step were beings that were looking in. They were stationed on those corners and they were looking in. And I was pretty amazed by this. And I recalled having heard in a lecture once when I was at university talking about these things that there are these invisible structures which happen in the, you know, in space. We can't see them, but they are there. And this was like the, the Vastu Purusha Mandala was actually fully energized, was totally inflated up in three dimensions, in space and in time, but not visible. And I got a glimpse of it. The next minute, I, well, wasn't even the next minute, seconds, I then um, glanced down and the doors opened. And Nataraja came out, then Shiva Kami comes out. And it really is, if you experience it, and you're right there, it is the commencement of the creation. There is absolutely no doubt about it. So when I, years later, came across, and I showed this slide the other day too, came across this extraordinary capital on a, it's a bit hard to see with this background light, but this is a stone carving from about the 5th century in Elora. And there is a, a stone carving on the edge of the capital where the, the column stands up and the, the pieces go out to support the beams on either side. There is a, a little square carved in here and in the centre of it, it has a spiral comes out and goes out and creates the universe and supports the whole of creation. That was exactly what I was looking at. That's in diagrammatic form, exactly what happens every time he comes out of the sanctum, and it happens twice per year. He's then taken out of the temple in a mad procession. Um, I have um, numerous slightly deformed toes as a result of participating in the mad procession, but I wouldn't miss it. Um, and he's taken out and he's put in this temple chariot and this huge timber chariot. The original, apparently there was an earlier one which was larger than this one. Uh, but the bottom part, the timber part with its four external wheels and two internal wheels, uh, it's the original Jagannath and it comes from Jagannath Puri. That's the word Jagannath that we have in the English language, comes from these temple cars. But the bottom part, the timber part, is actually representing um, time. It is the whole embodiment of time and it travels through time on these wheels. It's pulled by people, no automation, I'm sure you all know this. <laughs> You're not Westerners, I, I don't need to explain these things. Above the timber platform are a series of posts supporting a canopy. That represents space. Natraja is taken up inside that uh, temple car and is suspended by four ropes from that roof structure, the four Vedas. So he's hanging there, he is tied down to the platform, he's neither sitting on the platform nor fully suspended from above. He's actually hovering between space and time. And he's then taken around the fifth prakaram, which is the Anamaya Kosha, which is this manifest world. And that in our bodies, that temple is our body that represents our body. So this is our physical body. He comes out from the, the, the center of the heart, the Gabagraha, the Chitsaba, he comes out and sanctifies this whole creation. And that is what that festival um, ultimately does in, on this ninth day. Preceding him, all of the women and the children uh, go around and do these rangoli on the street. The street is washed which in June is fantastic because it cools it down a bit. Um, and then all of these um, Rangali are 
uh, drawn on the on the pavement and in the path of the, the chariots, and particularly in front of Nataraja's chariots. And then everybody offers to the deities as they go around and offers um, lamps, may, uh, make food offerings, um, dotis, saris, etc. And then it gets to the northwest corner and stays there for a couple of hours um, during normal temple closure times. But they are extraordinary space-time capsules, if you like. These are like astronauts. Nantaradra is like an, a an astronaut traveling in this, in this capsule which is going around the town. And um, as, the, as the chariot moves, uh, and I'm sure you've, a lot of you have seen this, as the chariot moves and the, it moves, it sort of twists slightly and then jumps forward and particularly going around corners. And he actually hovers and shakes like this. And it is, there is an extraordinary um, sense of love which is emanating from him and from Shiva Kama Sundari. And it is just, it, it just goes over the whole of everybody that is there. You don't ever have to have gone into the temple to see him because he comes out to see you. Then he's taken inside and then they do the uh, uh, Mahabhishekam for him. And, <laughs> and this, um, this Mahabhishekam starts around 2 a.m. And uh, it is quite an amazing function, and it finishes generally around about sunrise, around 7. This is for Arudra. Uh, and it's quite uh, an elaborate process, and there is lots of chanting, Nadeswaram, and, and uh, music accompanying this whole thing. And it is a very powerful function. The first time I saw it, I was a bit stunned. I, did, I wasn't too close. I was probably about from here to the back wall away from Nataraja. But I could still feel this extraordinary heat coming from Nataraja and Shivakami as they were being bathed. It, I couldn't fathom it and I couldn't work out how the, how the dictators could be up there and actually touch him without being burnt, without being scorched to death. The, the heat was very, very tangible. And and, and there was a sound too, which was, was quite extraordinary. And at the end of that um, Abhishekam, he is then um, showered with um, flowers, almost as though that heat is then subdued and, and flowers sort of, to my understanding, represented sort of that love of all of us Shiva Bhaktas who were there, um, offering our love um, to him to subdue this heat, if you like, but just to this extraordinary power. It's, it was like staring into the center of the sun, but without any distance. So that the flowers and the alankaram, everything all happen uh, after the Mahabhishekam, and then he is taken back up into, back up into the Rajasabha, where I said that he was then, uh, that's the proper place for Arudra Dashanam, and he is there as, a, as the king as a ruler, you go up there and he's actually fixed in place. They have a, a panka um, uh, in front of him and there is lots of um, sound and it's an extraordinary place. And it's very difficult to get in there because you've got about you know, 500,000 people outside who all want to go in and see him over a two hour period and sometimes it's less than that. So um, there's various ways you can get in if you know your way around. But uh, it's it's an extraordinary experience and the. The, the power is awe-inspiring, absolutely awe-inspiring. And from there, he then comes out of that with a procession, again, with a rush, with lots of Hiva Bhaktas in front and, and these huge fire torches as well. It's like something out of some extraordinary medieval procession. And he goes back into the sanctum. And luckily for us, he keeps his alankaram on for another um, day. So that for those people who didn't actually see that procession or see the Arudra Dashanam, they can see him there. And then the flag comes down. During this festival um, in 1988, when I was there, when I first met Parameshwara Dikshita, I and had these experiences, I went back to him and said, what's happening? I, I, I saw these things, I can't understand. And he just looked at me and we talked about this structure in the sky 
and he said that is what we have been building with all of our rituals all of our processions every procession all the chanting is actually energizing that being that Vastu Purusha Mandala it's actually making it really vital and calling all of the deities in to witness this and a few years ago um, after the Arudradashanam finished and the papers were out, you know, they all try and sneak photographs from Nataraja and put them on the front page, and they're not supposed to. But um, one of them said, you know, it is said that in times past, all the deities, all of the gods came to witness this. And I thought, he's got it wrong. It's, it's not in the past, it's present. It happens every festival. They just don't get it. This is not something which is historic. This is something which is now. It happens every festival. It happens every day in the temple. These rituals and all of these, um, these hymns that are sung, Devaram, everything, is so important that that continue in that temple because that's what keeps that place alive. Madraja's temple is extraordinarily powerful and it is because all of these guys go there, all of these, not guys, women, I mean, inclusive, humanity go there, and there are thousands, tens of thousands of people who come in every day and walk around that sanctum, at least once, and they go inside and they pay their respects to him, they surrender to him. That is where that is coming from. And this place is energized by that, and these rituals do that. So any attempt by government or anybody else to try and interfere with this process or cut down on the, um, dare I say, it, budgets for these things being able to be done, they, that should not happen because these things are beyond the manifest physical level, and, but they are so important for the well-being of the whole world. Every temple has its own version of this. I'm just giving you my experience of one of them. And then I have to fly home. And how do, you, how do you assimilate something like this in this world? And for me, uh, it's a case of um, knowing beyond any doubt that Nataraja is everywhere. There is, not, there is not a single atom which is beyond him. So I have never left that temple. I cannot be separate from it. It may be thousands of miles away, but it is not over there. It's always here. I think I've taken up too much time. Thank you. Dr. Alan Kruger, I don't know if you're aware, just a minute ago, Dr. Navaratnam sang a Tervaram about Aritra Darshanam. What he was singing was, uh, he was naming all the deities who came to witness Ardhra Darshanam. And what you explained just matched perfectly with the Tavaram. So thank you so much for sharing your wonderful experience with all of us. We are truly humbled to have here and to see, to witness the love affair you have with the temple and the God. Thank you. Narayana Nudu Nanuga Nangi Ravi Umindiranum 